As the saying goes, it takes a village. In our line of work, the ability to recover and rebuild after a disaster often depends on the partnerships and community planning set in place ahead of time. But how do you cultivate those relationships? And what does it look like when they're called into action? Today, we're going to take a look at one such village and find out. Welcome. I'm Russell Wooldridge, Senior Director of Development for DRI International. I'm glad you could join us today for today's presentation, Real Recovery Lessons and a Partnership that Passed the Test, DRI's latest webinar that offers real-world experiences and insights from seasoned professionals. Our presenters today represent the public and private sides of resilience who worked together in response to a record-breaking flood in Ellicott City, Maryland. They are Ryan Miller, Director of Emergency Management for Howard County, Maryland, and Larry Tweel, CEO of the Howard County Economic Development Authority. Among his credentials, Ryan holds DRI International's CBCP and CBCLA certifications and received the 2018 DRI Award of Excellence for Program Leader of the Year in Public Sector. Larry and his team at the Howard County EDA were recently recognized with the Transformational Excellence Award by the Maryland Economic Development Association, as well as the Unsung Hero Award from the Small Business Administration. If you have questions you'd like to ask, you can submit them during the presentation in the box in the lower left-hand side of your screen. Our speakers will answer them in Drive, DRI's bi-weekly e-newsletter, when the presentation is made available on our DRI website. Thanks for being here today, gentlemen. The floor is yours. All right, thank you, Russell. Uh, appreciate that. Hello, everyone. My name is Ryan Miller. I'm the Emergency Management Director for Howard County, Maryland. I'm here with Larry Tweel. He's the CEO of the Howard County Economic Development Authority. Hello. And you're going to see us referred to in shorthand as EDA throughout the presentation. All right, so uh, we're pretty eager to give you all a, uh, a little bit of a story here about a disastrous flood that we had in Ellicott City, Maryland on July 30th, 2016. But first, I want to walk through a few objectives for this time together. The first thing we want to do is talk a little bit about the value of a partnership between an emergency management office and a economic development authority. Uh, some of you might not even know that you have such an entity in your community. You probably do. Uh, so we want to talk a little bit about that value in partnering those two agencies together. We want to share with you some uh, takeaways uh, from both of us, from both Larry as the CEO of Economic Development and myself as the Emergency Management Director related to the flood of 2016. And then we also would like to share with you uh, some of the importance and value of connecting businesses with uh, local government as well as community-based organizations that might be in your community uh, regarding disaster preparation. But before we begin, uh, we'd like to show you a short video from the NBC Nightly News that will put the rest of the presentation into context. Now to the historic flash flooding being called a one in a thousand year event that destroyed a Maryland city. A state of emergency has been declared in the area where at least two people have been killed and dozens of others had to be rescued from the rushing waters. NBC's Tammy Leitner takes us into the disaster. These devastating images are our first look at all that's left of Main Street in historic Ellicott City. Just 48 hours prior, rushing floodwaters swallowed the town. There's people in the water! Destroying everything in their path. These residents formed a human chain to save a woman trapped in her car. I'm just glad that uh, we managed to save her. More than 100 people rescued, but at least two dead. 38-year-old Joseph Anthony Blevins and 36-year-old Jessica Watsula. Ellicott City sits in the Patapsco River Valley surrounded by steep hills. As severe weather hit the area Saturday night, six inches of rain fell in just two hours, overwhelming the small streams that flow into the river and causing water to surge down Main Street. It was so fast. Uh, I, it was 
it was horrifying. Gretchen Shuey um, still hasn't been able to assess the damage to her coffee shop. I actually watched video of the street as it was flooding right. and just could experience the, the terror of these people. All of this was cars everywhere. NBC News was taken deep inside the destruction zone. This is ground zero. It's safe to say that they're, they're all uh, damaged by some degree of water. Now more rain is expected this evening, which could add to the devastation. Tammy Leitner, NBC News, Ellicott City, Maryland. Hey, NBC News fans, thanks for checking. That video is uh, difficult to watch. Uh, every time we watch it, uh, the images of the town being destroyed are uh, tough to watch. We can assure you it does not look like that anymore um, uh, today, now in 2018. But let's take a moment to tell you a little bit about Howard County and Ellicott City specifically, since uh, many of you are located uh, not just within the United States, but around the world. Larry? So uh, Howard County is a, a small suburban county uh, in, in Maryland on the east coast of the United States. We are basically halfway between uh, Baltimore and Washington, D.C. Our population is about 315,000. Uh, we are well educated. 60% uh, of our uh, residents have uh, have bachelor's degree, and we're also the third wealthiest county uh, in the in the U.S. Uh, our largest employment sector is professional and and business services, uh, largely in the uh, technology, cybersecurity, uh, healthcare, IT uh, areas. So it is a a unique place where. Uh, Many of our residents either commute uh, south to uh, Washington, D.C. or commute north to, uh, to, to Baltimore or stay right here in the county and, and work. So it is a, a diverse, uh, well-educated, wealthy, uh, wealthy community and home to uh, Ellicott City. Yeah, we love Ellicott City. A uh, pretty neat place. It's uh, quite historic. It was founded in 1772 as a mill town. And why that's significant in the video uh, you saw that uh, water moves pretty quickly through the town, and that uh, was actually somewhat by design. When the Ellicott brothers sited the town there, they were trying to uh, large, uh, move large millstones, uh, milling operations. So it was a mill town uh, a couple hundred years ago, but it's also home to some pretty neat historic infrastructure as well. The oldest remaining passenger train station is there. The road that you can see in the aerial photo that cuts through the center of town uh, that is actually part of the original historic National Road West. So uh, literally as uh, you know, America was being expanded from east to west, this is one of the roads that carried, uh, carried wagons out west, uh, made, uh, made that particularly a very complicating factor in trying to recover the town, but that would be a whole separate webinar. Uh, and also uh, the town is home to not just businesses, but also quite a few residents live there in the small town as well. And a neat factoid for baseball fans is that Babe Ruth was actually married in Ellicott City. Uh, you can actually see the, uh, the steeple there in the top right-hand corner, that's St. Paul's Church. So this is kind of a fun photograph of Larry and I, but uh, we like to say that this partnership was an unlikely partnership and a unique one and one that hopefully by the end you'll see some value in potentially implementing in your own town. But that's me and Larry, he let me hold these scissors uh, uh, one day during a ribbon cutting, and that became sort of a joke uh, uh, between us because frankly, uh, five or six years ago, before they were incorporated into our emergency operations plan, I honestly did not know much about economic development. I knew when there was a grand opening, uh, I knew that they did ribbon cuttings. I knew they did groundbreakings and they had special uh, gold uh, painted shovels. Uh, and they sometimes would show up with large uh, jumbo checks, but I didn't understand the amount of resources that, that they could bring to bear, not just uh, during normal course of business in attracting and retaining businesses in the community, but they also uh, can use those same tools to help recover uh, a town like Ellicott City that suffered a, a disastrous loss. So why, why did we choose them or how did we come up upon economic development? Well, that really was somewhat born out of necessity. We had several emergencies or disasters, smaller in scale, five or six years ago when we recognized that we're pretty good at doing a lot of things in county government, but we didn't have an entity that was charged with the responsibility to interact 
directly with businesses. We felt we were we were uh, under-equipped in that area. So we went looking. Uh, we we found economic development, and we, we invited them into uh, into our process. And in fact, we asked them if they would like to be part of our emergency operations plan. So uh, I remember the day that we pitched it to them. It was uh, it was Larry and one of uh, his associates, Catherine Badola, and you'll see her name crop up again here shortly. But we sat down with them and gave them the pitch, and they said, "We're in. You know, what, what do you need us to do?" And that was really the beginning of the partnership. Uh, from there, we incorporated them into our emergency operations plan. In fact, this picture is our county executive, a gentleman by the name of Alan Kittleman, signing that emergency operations plan uh, into, uh, into action about three and a half years ago. You can see uh, on the left side of your screen there kind of what we do. We assess hazards, we develop plans, we train, and then we uh, you know, try to continuously improve on, on what we've done. The first training, actually, Larry brought his entire team. It was it was actually almost a little awkward because um, they didn't know that we only expected them to send a couple people, and they sent their in their entire staff. But they were uh, the point is that they were all in from the very beginning, and um, uh, it, uh, it was the beginning of a, of a really uh, valuable partnership, I think, for both of us. So the emergency operations plan was set in motion, and then as as we like to uh, kind of point out. And then really nothing happened. It was quite quiet, actually, for the first couple of years. Um, uh, that didn't last really long. We soon had a blizzard. Uh, it actually collapsed a, a large warehouse. And by having economic development in the room, they heard and they said, you know what, we actually, we've got some resources we might be able to assist that business owner with. Um, the business owner later reported back to us that while they operate around the country, they'd never received that level of uh, direct support. Uh, you know, and and then helping them walk through and navigate the process with the with the county, you know, how they get a demolition permit, how they uh, move some of their resources that, that weren't destroyed. So that was kind of neat, and we an unanticipated an unanticipated uh, result of having them in the room. Uh, we then later had a tornado uh, about a month before the blizzard. I'm sorry, before the flood. Uh, again, economic development assisted us uh, with that disaster. And then obviously the flood continued on uh, a little bit later. What we uh, what we started to realize, though, is uh, you know the the connectivity between uh, you know the, the county's emergency response uh, function and the business community was was critical. And uh, Howard County is uh, about. Uh, six miles away from uh, the National Security Agency and, and Fort Meade, and a lot of the uh, businesses in the in the county uh, have critical support functions uh, in, in in support of that uh, that mission. Um, and you know, a lot of those missions uh, can't can't fail, and uh, you know, loss of loss of power can be uh, can be devastating. Uh, a snowstorm. Uh, can uh, you know really hinder the uh, the operations and the mission? So uh, we we found it uh, imperative to start introducing uh, the, uh, the the folks at uh, Fort Meade, defense contractors, other installations throughout the county to our emergency management uh, folks because they're uh, you know there there's a lot of resources that that they needed to be aware of and understand that the county actually did. Uh, have an emergency uh, operations plan for the community, which I think uh, you know helped give them a, a certain level of comfort, knowing that their uh, you know, the business continuity was part of what the county was 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 considering. So another uh, really neat thing beyond that was uh, you know, we, we like to say economic development introduced emergency management. Um, to some of their special friends in the community, but uh, emergency management also had the ability to introduce economic development to some of our, we call our special friends. Uh, this is a photograph from inside our emergency operations center. And you can imagine economic development, they're already interacting with different parts of county government, but one entity that they didn't get to, to know very well uh, or, or set of entities were the public safety sector, so law enforcement. Fire and Rescue, we had a really neat opportunity early on for economic development to bring into the room some uh, 
some small local businesses that were pioneering new technologies, but they didn't know who to show it to. And they said, hey, could you get a room full of uh, some subject matter experts from these parts of law enforcement and uh, fire and rescue work and let them just interact? Uh, and it was really neat. In fact, the meeting ended when uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the special operations team from fire and rescue said, you know what, it'd be easier. Why don't we just take you back to the fire station with us and we'll show you some of the tools we use and give you some ideas of ways you might be able to improve on your product. So that was a real neat way to get this thing going, uh, to, just to see how, you know, we knew certain people, they knew certain people, but um, we hadn't ever, um, you know, had the opportunity to kind of exchange those, those connections. So, you know, we obviously no, noting that there's, there, there was great synergy, uh, synergy here. Uh, you know, we're, we're very active in the community. We host, uh, you know, networking events. Uh, we have a technology council. Um, uh, you know, it's a membership-based uh, organization. Um, and it was very easy for us to plug OEM into the, uh, you know, our, our, our community. Um, and, you know, specifically, um, you know, you're looking at a, uh, uh, the center photograph there. Uh, once a year, we uh, we make a special effort and uh, visit a, a hundred companies in the county. We call it Business Appreciation Week, and basically, on behalf of the county executive, uh, you know, we we tour the facilities. We thank them for for being in the community, uh, and you know, what are some of the things that you know county government can do uh, can do for them. And uh, on this particular this particular visit, uh, this company you're looking at. Was a, a large, uh, uh, you know, caterpillar uh, power generator dealership who has you know parking lots full of uh, you know power power generation equipment, um, you know pumps, uh, you know emergency diesel uh, generators, and we said, uh, you know, this would probably be a good a good friend to have in uh, in the midst of some disaster. So, in the course of our uh, our, our, you know, planning for the visit, we said we invited, uh, you know, Ryan Miller and his, and his team to come along and said these are guys you should you should know and uh, they should know you, and uh, that was uh, you know just a one example of how you know throughout the course of our events and uh, activities throughout the year we engage with uh, uh, with emergency management. It was really neat for us. What we found only once we began to meet some of these entities in the community of how much of the community we just didn't know uh, because they were just outside of our normal reach and they weren't part of our normal circle. So uh, that's one of the things we like to do in emergency management is you know, get to know the community better, understand the capacity and the capabilities within the community and, and to, to, have, to then be invited into the economic development world really uh, helped give a far better definition for us of uh, who is in the community and, and who could help us out during emergencies. So then uh, July 30th, 2016 is when the flood happened. Again, we could give a probably another whole day's worth of webinars just on the first few hours, but suffice it to say, if you live in the mid-Atlantic, you know, most days are hot, they're humid, they're hazy, there's a threat of thunderstorms, but this particular flood, uh, this particular rainstorm just started raining and just kept going and going and going. And in total, we received, uh, uh, over the course of uh, just two hours, uh, we received six and a half inches of rain, which is just a catastrophic amount of rain. Uh, that evening, by before uh, the next day, that late that night, I got an email directly from Catherine Badola, who I mentioned earlier, was the, one of the first people that sat down with Larry. We invited them into our operations plan, and she basically said, "We're. I heard about what's happening in Ellicott City. How can we help?" And I'll be honest with you: when we sat down with economic development, you know, at this point of the of the flood, probably three or four years earlier, none of us had ever really contemplated when they would get in, engaged. But I certainly never thought it would be the same day as the disaster. And you'll see in the next few slides the degree to which they were involved. I don't think we ever realized either the degree to which they would be involved. Uh, so it was literally us figuring this out as we were going, uh, but it was the engagement ahead of time that really made uh, things happen so quickly. 
So that was great to know that they were literally mobilizing without us having to ask for them. So we, 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 we quickly realized, I mean, knowing being part of the emergency uh, response plan was, was one thing and knowing to actually, you know, show up uh, was another thing. But, um, you know, it, it was about, uh, we, we quickly found out it was about uh, the, uh, the, the, the people, the human side of the story and for the businesses on Main Street to, you know, suddenly have their, uh, their, their life literally washed out uh, from from under them. Uh, this is a picture of uh, Tammy uh, Biederman looking at her. She was one of the more successful shop owners on the street. And one of our uh, one of our first uh, actions was to even just get people uh, down into into the area, which had been you know after the next morning it officially was closed off to all public access. Just to get people down into uh, into the city to at least see what it what had happened, and um, that was part of our sort of initial uh, initial actions. Yeah, that I I don't think I realized how much of just the human piece uh, economic development took responsibility for. Uh, frankly, they were the ones that were shoulder to shoulder with the business owners, and we heard that. I heard that after the fact of, well, you know, actually I just needed to sit with them for a while and, and allow them to process. So it was as much almost felt like social work maybe at times uh, before they could actually get into the, the actual business recovery pieces. Uh, so that was something that we learned. And I don't know if you picked this up from the aerial photographs, but this, this town uh, from, from Jump Street, every square inch of it had about 15 things that needed to be done um, uh, simultaneously, and it just can't do that. So we're trying to recover infrastructure. Um, we're trying to uh, assess property. We're trying to stabilize things. So in the, the first few days, as Larry just pointed out, all we could do was allow a business owner to get into one of these ATVs. You can see one on the top left uh, of the photograph. That's We called them gators, and we enlisted uh, at peak we probably had 50, 60 of these gators that were the, the mode of transportation to get down into the town um, for the business piece was to allow them to go see their business. Uh, the next day it was you can get out and with a firefighter go in and actually maybe retrieve a key piece of property. Maybe it was a computer or uh, a safe or some key record. Uh, and then, you know, a few days after that it might be we can let you in escort, escorted for 15 minutes and whatever you can put into this plastic bin will bring back on the gator. So it was, it literally was, you know, um, um, phased in uh, all the way to then when you might have really thought economic development would be involved in the maybe months later or weeks later, they really started from literally day one with a direct uh, connection with the businesses and helping them uh, tactically uh, recover. Again, elements that I don't think we ever really thought um, were going to be a part of part of the, uh, the algorithm, but in the end, they, it, it really worked quite well for us. The incident management team, this is just a photograph to give you an idea of the response and the, the amount of infrastructure that we needed. At the end of the day, this wasn't a, a widespread disaster. Most of it was focused around the Ellicott City area, you know, the business area, the residential area, and some parts outside of the, the business district in the living uh, historic district. But it was way beyond our capacity, and we brought in an incident management team from Pennsylvania. It was supplemented by forces from as far away as Colorado. It was a Type 2 incident management team for any of you who uh, are part of that, uh, you know, understand the incident management team system. So it was a very large team, and they literally set up a, a full base camp, uh, uh, you know, in a vacant parking lot in Ellicott City. Uh, but it was, uh, again, way beyond our, our normal uh, abilities to manage. Kind of moving into the short-term recovery, we would define this as somewhere between maybe, you know, day one and, uh, you know, uh, week one or week two, somewhere in that time, time frame. But uh, I really like this photograph because it uh, shows a signature photograph of Larry there with his uh, uh, ball cap under his hard hat, which... <laughs> Uh, was a new innovation. I'd never seen that before, but I joke with him, this is what happens when you bring economic development professionals into the operations center. It's, it's kind of unpredictable. Uh, he's normally wearing a suit. In this case, it's a hard hat and a reflective vest. But this team is literally 
he's in the uh, in a in a, a, a makeshift operation center that was just public works, and he's in there kind of advocating for, you know, hey. If, if, if we could keep this road open, if we could move the perimeter in a little bit, I think we could probably um, help, uh, res you know, get some access to businesses. So kind of being in the tent or being the operations center, I think, from, from the get-go uh, was, was, was very, very important. The top photograph is our operations, uh, our, I'm sorry, our policy team, our county executive is uh, at the very top of the photograph there in front of the uh, computer uh, monitor. And this is, you know, our policy setting team. Again, uh, economic development had a seat at that table as well. And in the far right, that's a convoy of the Gators uh, kind of making their way in and out of the town. Um, at times operated with fire and rescue, uh, at other times uh, maybe with uh, some, some uh, volunteer resources. So the you know, the, the, the short term recovery it was it was us showing up every day and just helping folks uh, you know get access to some important items helping them clean out the mud clean up and uh, you know just begin to you know re rebuild the business but you know the the intermediate uh, recovery I mean call it uh, you know from you know month two to you know month month four to six was you know really where um, you know that the help uh, was was still needed, um, and we we needed a uh, a goal to shoot for, uh, and you know while this happened on July 30th, uh, we were shooting for to get some businesses back open by Small Business Saturday, which is the uh, Saturday after uh, uh, Black Friday and the, the Thanksgiving holiday. And it really became a, a goal for us to do everything we can to get as many businesses open because, you know, these are uh, small uh, specialty uh, merchants and make over half of their revenue in the Christmas shopping season. So it became a, uh, a goal for us to, to do as, as much as we can uh, to uh, at least, you know, show that the town is still alive and provide hope and give uh, folks something to work for in the midst of trying to, you know, rebuild the streets and make sure that the structures were safe. I mean, this was a huge, you know, public works, you know, project and uh, security perimeter project. So the, the coordination it took was, uh, you know, was, was massive. And uh, what, we, what we did was... Um, you know, in order to, to make that happen, we actually opened uh, uh, on the street. We helped renovate a, a, a retail uh, a storefront that had been vacant uh, prior to the flood. Um, we, we dressed it up, and that became our base of operations uh, for all of the agencies that everyone on the street uh, needed. It was um, housing the state uh, agencies, Housing and Community Development, Commerce, Department of Labor, Historic Preservation, the, the county's emergency uh, manager uh, were literally on the street and uh, easily accessible to uh, the folks who were still trying to clean out their business, still trying to rebuild their business. And it was that long term, longer term sustained set of resources that uh, were, were present that uh, helped to uh, get as many businesses open as we could by Small Business Saturday and beyond. And here's uh, in that photograph on the right-hand side, there's Larry back in his normal element with a suit on, and I think the jumbo <laughs> scissors are in there somewhere. Um, and to his right is our county council uh, uh, person, John Weinstein, that represents Ellicott City, and that's Catherine actually to, uh, in the left, to the left of Larry and the county executive as well, uh, uh, Alan Kittleman. I think that is actually an element that was pretty neat. And there's a, a whole host of entities in the millworks where you brought them all to bear uh, in one place. And that was key where people could literally just kind of walk in and say, hey, I'm thinking about bringing a business to Ellicott City or I have a problem or a challenge that could literally walk in and, and get things solved. I had a gentleman come to us about six months or so from the Small Business Administration. He called it fingertip feel. Uh, that that was provided, and that's I think that is unique. What we hear normally is 
call into a place or send a form somewhere, but literally you could just walk into an office and get uh, get most of your uh, issues addressed was, was pretty key. And sometimes they were frustrated uh, businesses or residents, and other times, um, you know, they, 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 there was a, maybe an opportunity to do something differently. So a really neat feature. Moving on here to long-term recovery, we were fortunate. I mentioned that we had resources come in as, from as far away as Colorado. We had some subject matter experts that reached out to us just at the right time and gave us some, some advice, frankly, that um, we had the beginnings of a recovery plan, but it wasn't, frankly, completed, uh, a community disaster recovery plan at the time of the flood. Uh, we're upfront about that, but one of the things that we were fortunate to have is some information about other disasters around the country. Think like Joplin, Missouri, or Greensburg, Kansas, and some of the lessons that were learned from Hurricane Sandy. We were able to infuse those elements into our recovery plan, but a, a key is that long-term disaster recovery is, uh, is, is different than maybe some of the ways you would normally recover a community uh, or, or, or rebuild a community or develop a community, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Uh, the normal master planning processes uh, are incredibly detailed and, and the teams that do that work are exceedingly professional. But what we learned is there was a, there was a phase that we needed to, to, to manage to be able to hand that off in good order. And we were able to do that uh, about, about a year after the flood, um, 10 months or so, we were able to hand that off to our, our master planning team through our Department of uh, Planning and Zoning, and they've done an amazing job. In fact, because they flew alongside of us for those first eight months, they were able to drop in some really neat features like um, uh, using public engagement tools that we honestly weren't accustomed to. But we had some great subject matter experts that spoke into our process at the right time, uh, and were able to give us some great coaching um, to, 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 to allow us maybe to not make mistakes that we would have otherwise potentially made. But you can see there in the photograph, that's, uh, that's a reminder, uh, as Larry led off with, is it's all about the people who live and work there. It's a community. This isn't just about Ryan Miller, Larry Twill, our agencies. You know, if, if you knew the team that was around all, both of us to, to, to bring this town back together, uh, again, it would be a week's worth of webinars, uh, but we're now on a path with long-term re uh, uh, recovery that um, is all accessible to you, by the way. I want to point out, if you went to uh, www.howardcountymd.gov um, backslash uh, ECMP, that stands for Ellicott City Master Plan, or if you just Googled Ellicott City uh, Watershed Master Plan, all those documents are available for you to look at and you can see how we've managed that process. And then we just wanted to walk through some before and after photographs for you also so you can see sort of what it looked like a couple days after the flood and then uh, what it looked like one year later. I think these were taken the following fall. So this is looking uh, down Main Street. This is some of the hardest hit areas Larry mentioned earlier, um, one of our businesses, Sweet Elizabeth Janes, they were formerly in the building called the Kaplan's Building, the base of Main Street, one of the hardest hit parts of the, of the town. This is today. This is uh, down near where the little streams all meet the Patapsco River. And in some of those photographs, you might have saw that there's still asphalt actually on the sidewalks. One of the things that our county executive said early on is, we want this to be a model resilient community and we don't wanna do anything that's gonna take later opportunities to reduce risk off the table. And we don't wanna do anything that our community doesn't have a chance to comment on. So if it's something that um, uh, they can weigh in on or we can wait for the master planning process to surface a best practice or a way to reduce risk or just what the community wants and we're going to do it. So if you visit, visit us this weekend, you'll actually still see some asphalt, but that's because uh, the master planning process is not yet quite complete. It'll be wrapped up this summer and uh, a lot of those longer term um, fit and finish elements will be uh, wrapped up and completed. So here we are today, 96% uh, businesses returned, 72% of the displaced residents have returned. 
Uh, only 5% of the businesses aren't returning. We're uh, happy to see 19 new businesses have actually opened and several more are on their way. I think uh, you know important to point out in you know when when this happened, uh, you know a lot of the uh, a lot of the research, a lot of the experts said you know typically you know plan for a long term recovery. About 20% of your uh, you know business community will 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 respond and or return, and uh, you know a pretty grim statistic kind of uh, going into it. And uh, um, we were we were very pleased to see uh, the. Speed of the recovery and the resiliency of the of the folks in the town willing to, uh, you know, reestablish and uh, you know give it uh, give it another try and um, yeah, 96 percent of the businesses that's a uh, it's a great uh, statistic we're very proud of it um, but it speaks to the uh, uh, you know uh, resiliency of of the folks and you know from a uh, a real estate perspective the vacancy rate on uh, on Main Street is is actually better than it was uh, prior to uh, prior to the flood. So um, you know, it's it just kind of speaks to the you know in in part uh, you know the work that you know the entire the entire team did, but it also uh, to the community for uh, you know responding in, uh, in the way that they did. Yeah, we can't uh, uh we, we, we can't uh, understate the amount of patience that they had you know as, as we said before there's just there's a lot of work to be done on us in a small area on a tight timeline we had the entire road shut down uh, for uh, over a couple months uh, and it required a lot of a lot of patience and a lot of trust that uh, we were navigating in a, in a good direction so uh, quite an experience so Larry and I had the uh, had the opportunity to visit the, the conference we presented a similar presentation uh, at the DRI annual conference this past February it was actually on Valentine's Day uh, and in that presentation we shared 96% businesses returned and uh, we later got a call and they said Al, Al Berman uh, of the DRI Foundation wants to stop by on his way from New York down to DC and actually see Ellicott City for himself so we had a really neat opportunity to show him around the town this photograph in the center shows uh, on the left that's our county executive again Alan Kittleman there's Al Berman myself Russell Woldridge who many of you know uh, with DRI business development uh, there's Catherine Badola Larry and then on the far right is a gentleman by the name of Phil Nichols with our county administration that was also a key element of the uh, response and recovery and then just some photographs around the edges of uh, meeting with some local businesses though the photograph on the far top right of the Phoenix restaurant is a neat story in that the business owner recently announced uh, quietly without a lot of fanfare that all of the money that he raised through GoFundMe he was actually re returning back to the community uh, and into other nonprofits so what a neat uh, metric for um, a, a business and its recovery is that they're now to the point of being able to be generous to to others in need so that was really neat and a, a neat opportunity to introduce uh, Al and the team uh, well actually I'll, I'll point out one other thing uh, in that interaction uh, the business owner Mark turned to Larry and he said Larry I, I actually didn't recognize you in a suit <laughs> <laughs> so I thought that was really neat that uh, he didn't he didn't recognize Larry wearing his suit again he actually knew Larry in his signature uh, hard hat and ball cap so uh, I thought that was kind of a, a neat visual of economic development uh, in this context was, was wasn't wasn't wearing a suit they were they're accustomed to seeing them in a hard hat so so that was a really great uh, opportunity and visit that we just had a few weeks ago as we move towards closing out uh, we'd like to share with you just a few a uh, few lessons learned I, you know, just to start off um, you know one is uh, you know, ec ec economic development uh, does a lot of things uh, in, in your community. Uh, if you're aware of them, you probably know them as the folks that are trying to attract uh, new business uh, to the uh, to the area. And while that's while that's true, um, you know most of our work is actually done with existing businesses in the community, uh, helping them uh, helping them grow and expand. And the resources that we uh, that we provide uh, to to foster that, whether it's through uh, you know, business counseling, 
business financing, uh, real estate assistance. Uh, we're the conduit for uh, permitting assistance and you know just a variety of other uh, of other resources to help local local existing businesses uh, grow uh, and uh, and innovate. And we believe if you do that well, you become a good good target for attraction, and your attraction business becomes. You know, much easier to do. So, if you're not aware of your economic development uh, uh, agency, uh, you know, reach out. Uh, you know, Google uh, your town's name with economic development after it, and uh, it'll it'll pop up either as a uh, agency of the government or as a uh, you know a public uh, private partnership like uh, like like the way we're built. Uh, but I would offer that as uh, you know, getting familiar with your uh, Economic Development Agency is uh, is a great resource uh, for you uh, in in any case, um, and then uh, you know um, I'll I'll give it over to Ryan for the second lesson. Yeah, so um, you know most most uh, most towns or counties, uh, definitely states have robust emergency management teams, and they frankly, have done a lot of the hazard analysis maybe for you. So, you know, those of you who do uh, business continuity, do uh, risk management activities, I would encourage you to reach out to your Office of Emergency Management, take full advantage of the resources that they might have already at their disposal. We have a a product that is called our uh, Community Hazard Handbook. Uh, That is a very uh, short, kind of glossy booklet that actually... Larry's team has available to them when a business comes to the community or they're retaining a business, they can put it in their hands, but they're actually, they actually hand them out in that business appreciation week that we just mentioned. And the idea being, you know, uh, this is a good place for you to have your business because our emergency management team's already thought about some of the things that you're going to want to know when you come here and you get insurance or you start working on your own continuity plan. So uh, that was, that's kind of a, a neat a product that we're able to to offer as well, and then obviously just you know uh, relying on your emergency manager for any of the other kinds of uh, preparedness activities or connections to resources that they might be able to to offer to you. And then the last one, uh, so it's get to know your economic development person, get to know your emergency management office, and then uh, ask the question of both of them: Do they know each other? That's one of the key elements we feel here is. And we've heard this as we've, uh, frankly, as I've sat in on some of the uh, economic development um, uh, conferences. Uh, Larry's team was uh, presented an award uh, last year, and I heard them say, essentially, if if you don't have economic development in the operations center, in the tent, when decisions are being made, uh, then you're not, they're going to make decisions with you or without you. So you need to get into the tent. You need to get into the operations center. And we were fortunate uh, to have leadership. Our county executive uh, is ultimately the one that uh, made the policy decisions to say, "Yeah, well, this is this is important. We need them. They need to be sitting at the table, um, you know, from the very beginning." And so, we would just ask uh, or recommend to you that you ask those questions. You know, do they know each other? Um, and if they don't, maybe you know, maybe make the introduction because uh, we feel like some really neat things. Uh, can happen, as we said earlier, you know, when 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 things are going well, there's some really great value we think that can happen for both organizations. And then clearly, when disaster strikes, uh, there's some really neat uh, value that can be brought to bear as well. So those are a couple lessons. We also have some contact information here. If you like any follow-up information, we're certainly willing to share um, more than we've done here on this webinar some telephone numbers for you to reach out, and you can always reach out to us also through DRI. So thank you again for joining us. Uh, And again, this has been a a great presentation for us to share with you. It's been tough, frankly, to try to share it in 45 minutes or less. Uh, We could go on and on for probably weeks, but we won't. Uh, We'll turn it back over to DRI. So thank you again for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan and Larry, and thank you again. It was a genuine pleasure when Al Berman and I visited in March to see the progress that you and Larry and your teams have made in Ellicott City since the flood. As a reminder, if you submitted a question, our speakers will respond in a special post 
for DRI's bi-weekly e-newsletter drive, which will be published when the webinar is made available on the DRI website at the link you see on your screen. And be on the lookout for our upcoming white paper, which goes in-depth into the Ellicott City recovery, which will also be announced in a future issue of Drive. This is a great time to announce that DRI International has added a special course to its calendar, the Public Sector Continuity Review, scheduled for November the 11th through the 13th, 2018. If you're an experienced public sector professional who's familiar with the major concepts of continuity, then you're a great candidate to take this fast-paced, information-packed course. While preparing you to lead a continuity program that will protect mission essential functions, this web-based instructor-led course will reacquaint you with the key elements of continuity management for the public sector. You'll gain all the tools you need to pass the public sector examination, which is the first step toward becoming a DRI certified public sector continuity professional or associate public sector continuity professional. And current DRI CPs can also earn 16 CEAPs towards recertification. Follow the links on your screen for additional information and to register. Sign up today. We'll expect to see you in the course because it fills up fast. If you still have questions that we didn't cover, give us a call at 866-542-3744. A recording of, of this and all other webinars are posted on DRII.org. I'm Russell Wooldridge. This webinar has been a production of DRI International 2018, all rights reserved. Thank you for your attention.